Good morning and good afternoon for the afternoon class. For week two, we are going to discuss about the different classifications of instruments. Let us proceed. Musical instruments. You might be asking, how does sounds produced from musical instrument? It is through vibrations. Now, how do we know if a certain device is a musical instrument? Simple. When a device is used to make musical sounds, it is called musical instruments. Since we have a lot of musical instruments, Horn Bostel and SAC classify musical instrument into four. The first classification of instrument is airphone. As you can see on the picture, we have flute and harmonica. Airphone are the instruments that produce sound primarily by causing a body of air to vibrate. Simple, you, you need to blow air to this instrument for you to hear the sounds. Now, aside from flute and harmonica, can you name some? Very good. Trumpet is also an aerophone. Another classification of instruments is chordophone. These are the musical instruments that make sound by way of vibrating strings or strings attached between the two points. Did you know that before nylon discovered as a string for guitars and violins, intestine of animals like cow or cattle and some horses were used as a string. Guitar and violins are the best examples of chordophones. Can you name some? Well, harp is another chordophones. Idiophone is another classification of instruments in which vibrations came from the instruments itself, like cymbals and xylophones. The sounds came from the body of cymbals as well as the xylophones. Can you name some idiophones? Very good. Maracas is also an example of idiophones. The fourth classification of instruments are the drums, or basically known as membranophones. The vibrating elements of these instruments are the membrane, usually synthetic plastics, or organic like animal skins. Like the drums, some of the drums are made of plastics and some are made from the animal skins. That's all for music for week two. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon for the afternoon class. For week two in arts, we are going to discuss about the arts and crafts of Southeast Asia. Let us begin. In Thailand, they are very proud of their Thai silk or seda natela in Filipino. Silk are textile made of cocoons of silkworms. Though it is called a silkworms or worms, it is a family of caterpillar or basically 
the last cycle of this silkworm is a moth in which a relative of a butterfly. It is mainly produced in Korat, which is the center of the silk industry in Thailand. To maintain a good quality of silk, they feed the silkworm of mulberry leaves only. These are the example of silk textile made from Thailand. In Malaysia, Batik is famous. Later, we have a video of batik making and designing batik for art lessons. The term batik is an Indonesian Malay word believed to be related to the Malay word titik, which means point, dot, or drop. It uses resist technique covering areas of cloth with a dye-resistant substance, usually hot wax, to prevent them from absorbing colors. Batik design is used in Southeast Asian country, particularly Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei. On the picture sample of batik, the yellow gold are made of wax. This helped the painters in avoiding the mixtures of colors in textile. For batik design, we have two main types of batik. The first one is hand painted. In hand painted, it uses the canteen or a small copper container in which the hot wax are being poured. Imagine like a marker or a ball pen that has a different tip depending on the design. Another type of batik design is what we call black printed. It is done by welding together strips of metal to form a metal block. The metal block is then dipped into molten wax and pressed against the fabric in order to make a pattern. Now, let us watch a video on how does batik is being made. This video is made by Mark Murphy. The designs you're looking at come from an art or the designs you're looking at come from an art or craft known as batik. It's been around for centuries and originated in Java, Indonesia. Batik has been part of an ancient tradition that you can now see at work here in this factory that was established in 1973. I love going behind the scenes to see how that finished product actually gets created. And we're going to do just that. See these different blocks? These are actual designs. And those designs are applied to typically two types of fabric, either silk or cotton. What this gentleman's doing is he's taking one of those, one of those designs, he's dipping it in hot paraffin wax, and he's stamping the cloth. Underneath here, the reason this table is spongy is because they put a sponge underneath that absorbs cool water that allows the paraffin wax to set up immediately and harden. What you get is something like this prior to the next process. And as you can see, this is wax. 
there's no color to the fabric yet because it has yet to be painted. Now that's not the only way you can do this. You can use the block, and that's the cheaper version, or you can do a hand painting. And what this lady did is she designed and hand drew these elements, and now she's using that little tool to apply the paraffin wax to the design. The reason they do that is so that the colors that are then applied next don't bleed into the various areas. You'll see that effect here in this next step. Notice how the paraffin keeps everything separated. And this is a very detailed process by which this person's gonna hand paint this entire design. As you come down to the next spot here, you'll start to get an idea of what the finished product is going to look like. The finished product still has the wax on it and the color has been painted, but it hasn't been set up, meaning it, it's not color fast yet. They actually take these cloths and they put it into a special mixture and it makes the fabric and the color bind so it doesn't bleed out when it gets washed in the future, but you still have that paraffin wax. You have to get rid of the wax. So how do you get rid of the wax? The way you get rid of the wax is you On this video, it will show us on how to use Batik Technique Design on art making. Making a piece of artwork using the traditional method of batik requires vats of dyes and pans of melted wax. It's a beautiful but time-consuming process. Traditionally, batik was most often used as a method for creating designs on cloth that would be used for clothing or household items. A design was drawn with a pencil, and then redrawn with hot wax using a tool like this. This is a chanting tool. Wooden stamps were also sometimes used to create patterning on the fabric. Then the fabric was dipped into various vats of dye to produce an intricate and beautifully patterned cloth. The areas where the wax penetrated the fabric would resist the dye, and once everything was dry, the wax would need to be removed by boiling or scraping the cloth. But by making a batik composition on paper, the ancient process can be taught in a much simpler way. Instead of using wax as our resist, we're going to be using a much more modern material. This is Mod Podge, it's a super gloss version. Instead of brushing it on, I filled two different squeeze bottles with the medium. One has a thicker tip and the other is a fine liner type tip that produces a, a more detailed line. So this way it can be trailed on, very similar to the way it's applied traditionally with a chanting tool. I'm using a sheet of Canson watercolor paper for my project, and I have given myself just a few very fine, very faint um, pencil lines to guide my, my composition. So I'm gonna start with this thicker bottle, and you really get quite a bit of control using it this way. And then if you would like to go in with the thinner line, you can just add a lot of detail this way. So once you've done all your trailing, your piping with the Mod Podge, the compositioner will need to dry completely before pigment is added, um, and with one exception. While I'm using this wet medium, I wanna show you something pretty neat that can be done at this stage. I'm going to put a little bit of the gloss Mod Podge in the center of this area. Now I've decided I want this area to be textural. And what I mean by that is just very visually active. So I've just filled in this shape with the wet Mod Podge. And I'm gonna use ink crystals in this area. Now these are Brusho ink crystals. And they come in these great little containers. And if you've noticed, I've, I've punched three to four holes in the top of the container. And since it's hard to tell what color I've got, I have also used a marker to put a dot of the color on top of the containers. Now these crystals can be used like this by sprinkling into the wet medium. 
And um, as they sit on this Mod Podge, they're going to expand. And I want to show you a contrast here. So this is black that I used in this area. And this was done, the process was done almost identically to that. But this is how much those crystals expand as they sit on the medium. So it's always a good idea to use a little bit less than you think that you're going to want. Now, onto some other ways to use these crystals. In this area, I've just got a atomizer full of water, and I'm going to just lightly mist a portion of the composition with water. Then I can go in and drop the crystals in that area, and you're going to see how much they move. Now another way that I can do that, this is the wet area, so now over here I'm going to drop some crystals just dry just a little bit there and then I'll take my atomizer and just lightly mist. Now you can control how much water you put on this area obviously so in contrast where there's a lot of water used here you can get movement some kind of marbled effects and I can control this and leave this grainier if I want to do that. And then here I've just sprinkled some of the crystals into this plastic palette you can use these as a traditional, more traditional watercolor. So I'm just adding water right to them. And you can just pick them up with a brush and use them to fill an area. Just like a regular watercolor paint. And as you can see, these crystals go a long way. This method can be used to create a very traditional looking batik pattern or a more modern interpretation even portraiture. I hope you'll enjoy exploring batik on paper using modern materials. For a PDF and materials list of this lesson plan, please visit dickblick.com. Please do note of the materials being used because somehow we are going to do the same on our art lessons. In Thailand, sky flying lantern is famous. Flying lanterns are made up of rice paper with a bamboo frame which contain a fuel cell or a small candle on the middle part to help them propel up air. It is used during the year for festivals. The most popular is the Loy Kratong Festival. It is held on the night of the 12th moon, usually in November, with Chiang Mai believed to have the brightest and the most spectacular. Since it is based on the 12th moon, it doesn't have a fixed or same date year after year. They usually do it near the river and sea. Why? Just to make sure to prevent accident because this sky flying lantern is a fire hazard that can burn house or make a short circuit in electric cable lines. Another Southeast Asian country is Cambodia, in which their craft is what we call sa paper. They make paper by hand in the wider region for over 700 years using the bark of the local sa or mulberry tree. Traditionally, sa paper was used for calligraphy and for making festive temple decorations, umbrellas, fans, and kites. The one that you see on the picture are true or real leaves and flowers. Yes, you heard me correctly. The leaves that you see are real, and the flowers are real flowers. Now, 
Let's go to Indonesia. Wayang Kulit is a shadow puppet theater of Indonesia. Wayang means to show or perform and kulit means skin. A traditional gamelan orchestra or accompany the storytelling. Wayang Kulit or Shadow Puppet Theater of Indonesia is a form of theater. But for this quarter, you just need to focus on the puppet itself. Notice the arts of the puppet being used. In Malaysia, their kite, yes, kite or sarangola in Filipino, is very famous and level up. That is why they called it Wow Kite. It is a uniquely designed Malaysian kite. Its wings are similar to an Arabic letter pronounced wow. Pasir Gudang International Kite Festival is a festival that features different colorful wow kite. Let's see the picture. Notice the arts of their kite. The design. It's very beautiful. That's all for today. Thank you and God bless.